Hello, Professor Jenkin. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Westlake High School. I know you're you're busy and, and doing lots of things and all of us stuck here at home in our own houses and doing what we do, but uh, we appreciate you taking your time to, to talk to us about uh, Lincoln Shraposi. I'm happy to do it, Mr. Taylor, and hi, Westlake Band. And uh, you know, it is, it's true, I am busy, but man, it's a different kind of busy right now. So it's, uh, everybody's finding out, um, and for me, I, I like, we were, I was talking about this with some colleagues yesterday. We're all in the same boat, you know, because we're used to conducting and teaching at school and all that. So this is just completely, our world has been a little bit rocked here as everyone's has. So I'm, this gives me a, I'm, I'm really happy to talk about Lincoln Chirposi with you guys. Well, good. If, if you don't mind, I'd just like to start with each movement and, and kind of sure. talk our way through it. Some things about maybe uh, what a conductor might choose mm -hmm. and think about they're doing as compared to uh, not just what's on the page, but performance practice. And right. some of those choices you might have to make in rehearsal as well. So I think of my students, and I know I'm interested in hearing you uh, talk about that and asking you some questions. I know we've talked about this piece some in the past, mm -hmm. and I've certainly seen you conduct it with the UT Wind Ensemble and, and possibly some other groups as well. Uh, I'm sure you've done this piece. Approximately how many times do you think that you've done this piece with the group? You know, as you were talking about that, I was I was already beginning to do the calculation a little bit because it's it's a lot. I've done it. Um, the first time I ever did it was the first year I was teaching at UT the first time in, in a different role, you know. And then since then, I've done it uh, at Michigan, at South Florida, probably three or four times at Texas, recorded it. Uh, with the Dallas Winds, and I've performed it there three or four times. And then it also became a piece that I would do every once in a while on the guest conducting circuit, you know. So I don't know. I've probably done it 20 times, something like that. Wow. wow. Okay. Good. Let, let's talk some about the first movement. Sure. Um, so one of the things we noticed, and it's, of course, in 6-8, and if you do a very strict 6-8 time, it feels one way, but in, his, in uh, the the score, it says also have plenty of lilt. Right. So what does that mean to you and how exactly do you interpret the 6-8 feel in this first movement? Yeah, I think it's not uh, strictly notated. Well, it is it's strictly notated, but I don't think it's strictly performed as one would perform 6-8, like the Washington Post March or something like that. You know, it's an interesting thing that when I, um, I go to Japan every year and conduct at this college there. And they always want me to do a very traditional, for the most part, very traditional program. So I've done Lincoln Chirposi there, but they also always want a Sousa March for an encore. I'm an American, they want, you know, American ending to the concert. And so every time I suggest a march that's in six, eight time, they always, uh, you know, and they, I can always tell they want me to come up with something else. So finally, I just said, can I just ask why is it that when I suggest the Washington Post or the Black Horse Troop or some march that's in six, eight time, I can always get the vibe that you don't want me to do it. And they said, well, Japanese people, this is them saying this. So they said, Japanese people don't understand six, eight. They can't play six eight. It never sounds right. And so I thought about that for a long time. Why wouldn't, why would that be? You know, rhythms are rhythms and notes are notes. But I think that something of it uh, is because this first movement tells us that it's an iambic pentameter. You know, I mean, the famous, but I think that I shall never see, you know, the, the famous thing that we're accustomed to in our rhythmic speech in English uh and in some other romance languages but that does not exist in japanese and so they don't have any sort of vocalization that relates to this rhythm um and it's interesting so what it, the reason for that long build-up is just to say i think this becomes all about the text and all about the text that he's using and if uh, a person were to do the text i don't i told mr taylor i'm doing i'm winging this a little bit i don't have my score is locked up at school, like I don't have access to it. But uh, I think the first movement is something like "Twas on, twas on the Monday morning, um, all in the month of May." 
even then, as I say that, that's not strict six eight. It's something else. It's some sort of a hybrid, and uh, it's it's difficult to chart it. I'm sure that some notation program could probably chart that and write exactly the way we would sing it or say it, but it's not exactly a true six eight. So it's got a little bit more of a balance to it, and. Granger, someone asked him what lilt meant because he used to use that in a lot of pieces. And I am so sorry. Uh, that's going to happen. Let me just turn the volume down. But um, he, he felt like it meant, it even says this in the preface, that it should be more emphasis on one and four in the six beats. Um, so that heaviness isn't the only thing. I think that's part of it. Da -da, bing, 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 bing. But those eighth notes are coming slightly I, but perceptibly later than they would if you were doing it in strict six, eight time. And I have heard performances that were in strict six, eight time that just to me sound ridiculous. Right. Real square. Stiff. Yeah, real stiff and square. Right. So you just were starting to sing the first phrase. Right. And, and the second full measure, but dum dee da 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 do you right. think that last note I sang, do you feel like it goes with the first half of the phrase or is it da da dee da dee da da? It's yeah. a back up to the second half of the phrase. Meaning I've heard some people separate those two notes that are repeated pitch right. and some people connect it to the first half and some people make it part of the second half. Does that make sense what I'm asking? No, it does. The, I, the way I hear it, the way I feel is that everything is detached, you know, throughout the whole movement slightly, not, not like staccatissimo or anything, but, but he does say here, I mean, he writes detached, you know, at the beginning. So I think that those dotted quarters, or even when it was a dotted quarter tie later on, that there's still not quite full value, you know, ta ta pipi pipi pa 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 pi pa pa pipi pa pi Bah, 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 bah. so that there's a little a very slight lift at least for me and i know some people um get bound up in thinking "Twas on the monday morning that right but you know that's that sends it off in a different direction because i think you're you should close it "Twas on the monday morning and then right. slight comma and then it, you get the second half of the phrase you know and we've all heard, uh, at least my band has heard the record, the original recordings, uh, and that certainly helps tie in the, the lyrics to things. And in fact, yes. we get into the third movement a little bit later, I'm going to ask you some more about that too. So, right. The interesting thing about those recordings, which uh, were those were the folk singers singing to Granger and with him recording it on his Edison wax cylinder. Um, which those wax cylinders are in the Library of Congress, by the way. But um, the interesting thing about that is that he was not necessarily, and he says this also and wrote some letters to Mr. Fennell later on about how he wasn't trying to notate the music the way they were singing it. What he was trying to do was do write some sort of a piece that would capture the personality of these singers because they were all so different, you know, the the, uh, each singer, they were all well up in their 70s and 80s, you know, when they performed these things. For him. So um, his notation goes with the original folk song sweat settings, but yet the way he orchestrates it, that's something about that is trying to get at the way these folk singers he felt like were always treated. That's why these dissonances come in every once in a while. Right. Okay. So I'm going to ask you one more thing about the rhythm part and the lilt part. Yes. When we get to, uh, I think it's square 18 and all the woodwinds are playing and the euphonium yes. and, and everybody's going through. Great moment. Right. And you have the, the counter uh, melody, so to speak. And it has on one beat three eighth notes yes. that will be in place while the melody is still going with the quarter note, eighth note. So mm -hmm. rhythmically, you are going to, some people are going to say, I want the third note, third part of each beat to line up exactly, but that would be contrary to the lilt fill uh, right. uh, that we have in the very first statement. So how do you make those two things match? Yeah, that's, if you get super anal retentive, it's, it's almost impossible to make them match. Um, but I think that the double bass and the timpani um, and in the low reed voices, we have 
you know, have that part um, in a way that once they have heard the first 18 bars, really it's 16 bars, but you know, the way it's right. numbered 18 bars of the piece, they, they kind of have this sense of the, I don't, for the lack of, for lack of a better word, the awkwardness of that, you know, rhythmically. Um, so it's not, because even if they play it exactly precisely, it sounds square again. Yeah, it sounds mechanical and, and Granger was never mechanical. He never did anything that was mechanical. Even when he was at his technical best at the piano, it was always, there was always great rhythmic liberties and all of that. So I think that everyone just has to listen to each other is the main thing. And people who like to have it very strictly prescribed are very disappointed by this piece because it just doesn't, the whole piece doesn't work that way. Right. Very, very, very few places in this piece. Right. Okay, skip on over to where we have the, the heroic bum, 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 bing, yes. bum, and yet we've got a combination of horns and euphoniums, saxophones, and also some trumpet in there as well. Uh, how do you like to hear that in terms of the, a dominant voice in all of those instruments or just a, a, a good blend of all of those? I think uh, a blend, but I do like the horns to be the predominant voice there with a little edge in their sound. Um, because it is, it's a different piece. I mean, it's like all of a sudden people turn two pages and now they're playing the wrong piece. You know, they're playing the Duke of Marlboro Fanfare, another piece of Granger's, right. uh, which is heroic. And I think that the saxophones, uh, all of these instruments, they have different colors, but because of the range is exactly the same saxophone, euphonium and horn. I think they're there to support the horns in a way. So if the horn dum bum bum beam bum ba da beam bum ba ya da da dim bum, and that's where the trumpets help is at the top, you know, by adding a coming into the color just a little bit more, um, so it brightens. Bing dum bum bum beam. I think that. Um, that's the moment when they are actually heard. I think the rest of the time it's pretty much a blend with the horns being the So you want actually you encourage a little bit change change in the timbre, if you will, yes. of that line as it goes through them. Okay. Right. Yeah, I want the color to brighten a little bit at the top of it. Okay. Cool. Um, let's let's skip there towards the last four measures or so. You know where we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, some groups crescendo doing while others did crescendo and speaking of changing of timbre and color. Oh, uh, yes. Great. So, all this right. Here. Great. <laughs> yeah. So what are, you, what are you listening for in those last four? The yeah. main thing I want to be concerned with is the English horn uh, and having the English horn come out because Granger loved the sound of reed instruments, all reed instruments, clarinets included, but he, he loved these instrumental families you know, all, that's why he used so many saxophones, all of the clarinets, but oboe and English horn. And so the English horn, you can play the piece without an English horn because it's doubled in the third clarinet. But nonetheless, it just, there's having the English horn. And it, I think he even writes nasal over it. Right. Uh, somewhere around there. So, I mean, he clearly wants that edge of sound. And every time in Granger's pieces, it doesn't matter whether it's this piece or whether it's, you know any one of the other pieces whenever there's a dissonance that's granger's inner rage coming out just a little bit in these really sweet lovely pieces you know so uh in this case i think he really wants to hear that edge in the english horn and that's the reason the the english horn resolution of the suspension comes later than everyone else and everyone else has this diminuendo and then finally the english horn arrives and then the English horn comes down. I realize that my, my camera is flipped here, so I'm going off screen. I don't mean to do that. <laughs> okay. we're, we're all struggling with that. So that takes us right into the second movement. Yes. And uh, I remember correctly from past performances that I've seen you do, at one point you actually connected the first and the second movements 
with yeah, I used sport. to do that. I don't, I don't do that anymore. Um, but I do start the second movement very quickly, very soon after the end. So and I actually try these days to play the whole piece with very little pause in between movements, more or less a top end. Mm -hmm. so, so, just, so it's a sweet, so I just feel like it works that way. What was your thinking on both why you did it with connecting it and then why now you no longer do it that way? Right, I, you know, just in looking at the score, uh whether i think when i first did this it was you know there was no full score back in those days it was just the rangers condensed score compressed score he calls them and it just as you would look at the last note of the first movement and look at the first note of the second movement it was like a jigsaw puzzle in a way because it's the same note basically and the orchestration just went like that you know so there was this linkage between the horns they play the same note to start that they end on saxophones euphoniums all of that all of the doubling so they're already there so it just seemed like huh i could do this so it's like the second movement has already begun in a way um and i i like that but yet the the more i thought about it after having done it that way a couple of times I thought, you know, that's that's rewriting the piece. And Granger knew how to make a fermata, and he knew how to write it, you know, so that's that's not what he wanted. So um, it is an interesting idea. I'm still kind of interested by it, but I don't I don't do it that way. I just do So about that much time, you know, um, rather than connecting them. And also, I think it makes for a more clear, the first note's hard to start, you know, and it's, as, as everybody knows, it's hard to get the attack, it, for it to be beautiful, for the balance of the first note to be what you want it to be. Are the horns going to lead or are the saxophones going to, is there going to be a vibrato in the sound from the euphonium and saxophones or not? How, how's that all going to work? And the so, low flat on the soprano sax. Yeah, yeah, just, you know, not the greatest notes to have selected. <laughs> so... Um, but still, I think the clarity of just starting a new idea um, is what led me to change that. Great. So that first note you're talking about comes back later as a pickup to, I think it's measure 10, body, and then yeah. as well later in the piece as a, as a written note, I believe. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so do you try to do though the second and third one, the, the one that's the grace note and then the mm -hmm. one that's the 16th note, do you try to make sure those are clearly heard before the beat each time or? No, I, I put them on the beat. And because, just because I wanna hear, it's not a crunch, it's not an appoggiatura. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a grace note, but I want it to sound the same every time. So even when he notates it as a 16th note, I still have people put it on you know, like that. Um, just, I feel like it adds weight to it. Uh, W-E-I-G-H-T, that kind of weight. Right. Um, so I, and I like that feeling of heaviness on that grace note. So it's not just a throwaway because I've heard so many performances of where you couldn't hear the grace note. It just went, but I think that took a lot of ink to write that, uh, <laughs> you know, and to make all those lines and to put it in all the parts, which Granger, all, he always by hand wrote all of the parts. So that he must have really believed in that grace note to do that. You know? Right. Or he would not have put that in there. That, right. Okay, so then after the the almost tutti band, it's not everybody. Right. Then we go into the trumpet solo. Yes, and it says, uh, "Yeah, strengths at will and to the fore and freely as well." Mm -hmm. so how much? Obviously, you give the soloists some liberty in what they want to do, but how much guidance? How much do you want them to do? both in terms of tempo and in terms of uh, dynamic shaping or contrast. Right. Well, the, since the form of this piece is the same as every other movement, which is strophic variations, you know, every, 
every stanza is a, is a slight variation. I think that the trumpet soloist can take some liberty, but I don't think it can be anything that's too wild, you know, uh, wildly different, or else it just doesn't make sense all of a sudden, because it is just another strophe in, the, um, in this tune. So, but usually what I do is we get to 14, and then I just let the sound melt down, and I, I don't really conduct that. I just let the diminuendo happen, and I just ask people to count for themselves so that they have no sound left at the end of their note. And they just, it just looks weird, first of all, I think for me to be up there doing like this, and the sound is going, bah, and nothing's happening, you know. So I just let everybody count, be on their own, and then, I kind of look at the trumpet player, make sure that she or he is ready to go and then give a little nod and then they start. And I pick it up in the five, four bar. And I usually mark that for everybody. And I'll just go, even though everybody by this point knows where we are, but still that's where I'll start conducting. And that's just, I'm not really conducting the trumpet or I'm following them at that moment, mm -hmm. but I want to be helpful then in the next bar when we have those, because that's that's important that crescendo you know that they have six against the four that the trumpet is playing so that's another great granger moment you know right <laughs> and then i asked the trumpet player to tongue the grace note the baya you know so that um so that again the grace note is clearly heard and so are you conducting through that measure, the six against the four, are you conducting the four in the trumpet or do you conduct the six or do you? I've done that every possible way. And it just kind of depends on, because I've, I've done it where I, you know, conduct only the trumpet. I just follow the trumpet. Yeah. And then I, I will give a little bit more on one and three just to make sure. And, but then the crucial thing is, giving them the B2 in the next bar where it's three so that they know ever we're all aligned because around that time is where the trumpet player is going to take a breath if she or he's going to take a breath and they usually they have to I always tell them don't worry about playing this all in one breath you know right. I think otherwise you you can make it a trumpet player can play that all in one breath but then they don't have the power at the end that it needs you right. know to make the crescendo um, I've done it where I've conducted these, uh, da, 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 you know, just as the situation dictates. And I've actually done it where I've done both, you know, de, right. de, 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 which is, you know, too busy. So that's ridiculous. But some, there have been a couple of like uh, situations where I was putting this together quickly with groups that weren't as experienced with it. And that actually was helpful, but I wouldn't do that under normal circumstances. Okay, so then we we finally get to 29 and 30 actually is where the last statement is. Okay. And finally, it's 2D and everybody's uh, blowing and going and we have multiple octaves on the melody that are so out of tune uh, for more, most groups. Uh, right. How do you address the intonation there on that melodic line? I just tell everybody to play in tune. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Because <laughs> right, that you're right. I mean, first of all, it's like a, it's got the worst notes on the flute, basically. Right. You know, and they're the highest thing that's going to be heard there. I will mention one thing about bar 29 is that there's a misprint in the score here, um, because the people who are joining, everybody should be marked piano with a crescendo to fortissimo and. Some of the woodwind instruments are marked forte with a crescendo and a fortissimo, whereas the brass come in piano. So it's, it's supposed to be everyone is piano. That's what it says in the Granger's hand manuscript. But for some reason, that has always been wrong. And even when Mr. Fennell made this score, that's just one correction that slipped by that didn't get in there. Yes. So that, that way, everybody can sort of hide their, you know, growth at the beginning of that. Um, I don't think I answered the question. What was the, oh yeah, yeah. One thing, let me just say that at, at 30 though, again, I have that 16th note, I treat it like it was a grace note and put it on the beat. Okay. 
And then, will you do the same thing over, right? Body, uh, Yeah, and that one, I like to stretch there. Um, di -ya. Because the next bar is the one where, again, the dissonance comes in. He's got this G natural versus a G flat and a C natural versus a C flat on the third beat, you know, so it gives this amazing crunch. And so the third beat, is the big moment, you know, not the downbeat. Dee, dee, da. So um, I think that is is another one of those Granger moments. He even writes something about that. There's a letter that he wrote when he was in Georgetown, Texas, uh, that he wrote to Roger Quilter, I think, and he talks about that moment, you know, and what how it gave him and his wife a thrill to hear it live for the first time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and what about the ending? Would mm. you uh, obviously you're going to put the grace note again on the downbeat? Yes, um, I think I, so, I think the ending for me comes too abruptly um, because after this big buildup, it just seems like it's over quickly. So I do slow off, as Granger would say, a lot in the last bar, and don't do it exactly rhythmically. So. If I were really counting what I was, the way I hear it, I would do one, two, three, four, five, six, one. You know, so it's not organic at that point. Right. Um, just to have the ending drawn out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And then have everyone go to silence. Although the last, I, I like to program uh, a little bit the last who what is the last sound we're going to hear so everybody doesn't go out at the same time at the end whether that's the going to be the low clarinets or clarinet three or so just so that there's or sometimes the tuba have them hang over by one half second just so that there's a little bit more depth and resonance to the release there but have everyone else try to go to silence Great. I have, finally I have one more question about this. Sure. I'm going to ask if you have anything else you want to add. But I've heard th this piece, uh, this movement, at times in a very, very slow, almost pedantic tempo going through there. And other times I felt like it was, um, you know, like an andante moderato where we're just, <laughs> we're trucking on through and going on to the next thing. Um, and of course that all has to do with where we feel like its significance within the the total piece I think as well as its own individual character how what is your feeling about the tempo overall tempo on this not about taking uh right. liberties within that tempo but overall tempo no I get yeah that because this is uh something that I I think basically every time I do this piece I do the second movement at a slightly different tempo um and I you know, I've had my own blue period where I tried to go super slow, you know, and, um, but, but now I do it a little quicker than I used to. I don't know that I do it quite as quickly as Granger notates it, but you know, there are re several recordings, one of him conducting the UT symphonic band back in the in 1951 and then there's one of him conducting it at Michigan and one of him conducting it at Interlochen that you can get your hands on and and it, it, he also plays it at the piano there are recordings of him playing at the piano and every one of them is different they're all within the, within a ballpark but it, it's certainly not a strict thing for him tempo so um, tempos in Granger pieces are always a little funny because I think he was such a fluid musician himself that if he happened to write a particular tempo one day, that's not the way he was going to do it three days later. So I don't know that we need to get too hung up in that. But I think to answer your question, this can go too slow and it can also go too fast. And so finding some sort of happy medium is the right thing. I don't know what that is. You know, this last time I did it, that ended up for me being around 67 or 68, at least at the beginning. Um, but I've, I've done it probably in the 50s, you know, and I've also, I don't know that I've ever done it at 72, 74, 76. You know, that seems, it just seems fast to me. Yeah. You can't hear all of the dissonance and the notes that are in there. You know? Right, 
Yeah. And the, and one of the great things about that movement, I mean, there are many great things about it, but one of them is the beauty of the color, you know, the saxophones and all of that. So I think you kind of want to savor that, at least I do. Right. Anything else about that movement before we move on? Uh, I don't think so. The You know, I do think the big dramatic moment at 30 that descending low brass line, getting that to be as articulate as it needs to be and as powerful without ha having everyone else make it impossible for them to be heard. So I think in a way, the dynamic of whatever it is, fortissimo or triple F, whatever it is, uh, has to be maybe toned down by the remainder of the group just to give the third trombone etc you know they can play really loud and still not be heard on this you know if everybody else is like really playing strong and it's real easy with that particular group of instruments too if you let them play too loud that they lose some of the the overall oh, yeah. sonority that you want right and then and then it's just all a big mesh mess of sound rather than having you know, the clarity that I think Granger does want. Right. 